Hello, I'm Maureen Nikitas, Berwick Community Television Committee member, and today I'm your hostess for Project Remembrance, the third production. And what this is, is a tribute to the past and present members of our armed forces and showing our appreciation of the sacrifices that they have all made. Project Remembrance is a series of interviews that we conduct with members of our armed forces. We learn a little bit about what they've done and what they're doing now and what they plan to do in their futures. We're also doing this for the sake of posterity, which is very important. We'll be interviewing more veterans, both active and retired, female and male, as time goes on. Today, we will be speaking with Dick Moore, of Berwick, Maine, who proudly served in the United States Army Reserve. So, Dick, hello, and could you tell us just a little bit about yourself to start off? Sure, uh, Maureen, uh, I'm glad to be here, and uh, this is kind of being on the other side of the table for me because I was the host for the, for the first two, so it's gonna be a little bit different. But my name is Dick Moore, uh, more or less, and uh, I spent 10 years in the United States Army Reserve. I've lived in Berwick for 43 years. I grew up in Summersworth until I got uh, married. And uh, this is a photo of my family, and that's me on the left as a little tyke, and uh, my father and my mother and uh, my older brother, Dennis. And uh, I was the baby of the family. I had uh, three other older brothers, uh, Dennis in the picture, and uh, I had uh, Ernie and Bob. They're both gone now. And uh, Ernie served in the uh, Korean War. Uh, Bob never served in the military. So uh, my dad died when I was 10 years old. And uh, wow. he was 52. And he basically worked himself to death. And uh, my mother took over from, uh, you know, the time he died, and, and God bless her, we were, I came from a very poor family, and uh, she did so uh, right by us. Uh, I'll, n I'll never forget some of the things she did. My brother Dennis uh, took over, kind of. He was in high school. I was only 10 years old, but he actually did a lot for me. He became kind of a father figure, took me places, and kept me out of trouble, and uh, things like that. I met my wife, Diane, at a school dance, and uh, it was love at first sight. <laughs> and that's us in the wedding photo. And if you, you know, if you kind of look at me in that picture, what a hunk. I mean, how could she resist? You know? <laughs> I was thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you know, anyway, but uh, my son, Bill, uh, was also uh, in the service for 15 years. He went to Maine Maritime Academy. and. Uh, he served 15 years, he made it up to uh, uh, lieutenant, and uh, now he works civil service uh, for the Navy, kind of a turn of uh, things for him. But uh, I've also got two sons, uh, Ryan and uh, Patrick. Neither one of them served in the military, but they've both done pretty well for themselves. I understand that your service career was entirely in the U.S. Army Reserves. I'm just wondering, why did you join the Army? Why did you choose that branch? And if you'd like to tell us a little about your service record, that would be great. Well, the reason I joined, I mean, I graduated from high school in 1966, and the Vietnam War was really gearing up, and they had just instituted the draft. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't want to go to Vietnam. I mean, neither did anybody else, you know. But my brother Dennis was in the Army Reserves, and he says, you know, why don't you uh, join, you know? So I said, well, geez, that sounds good. So uh, I joined the 76th Division out of Rochester, okay? And this is the uh, patch here. And uh, they served uh, gallantly in uh, both World War I and in World War II as an infantry division. and. Uh, they were in France in World War II, and that's what that little white thing is here. It's representative of a French telephone, actually, is what oh, that is. Yeah. that's interesting. But uh, after World War II, they changed their designation and made them an Army Reserve Division, okay? Uh, they were based out of Rochester, and uh, 
When I joined, uh, the deal was you went to a drill every uh, three Monday nights and one Sunday. Most Army Reserve units at the time went one weekend, mm -hmm. but uh, we went three Monday nights and that so is forth. Different. And every summer we'd go for a two week uh, annual Ag Dutra, they call it An Ag Dutra. And we would go to Fort Dix, New Jersey. And the thing of it is, we were basically a training division. We weren't actually designated to be a fighting division. We were a training division, which meant that we drilled to, to train people how to fight and how to, you know, do the, uh, you know, be in the Army. So what happened was when we'd go to Fort Dix in the summer, we'd take over a basic training company, okay, and uh, actually train them for whatever phase they were in. Basic training is usually eight weeks. You know, in the first couple of weeks is, uh, you know, drilling and things like that, and then you get a week of rifle firing and this and that. So we'd take over whatever they were, mm -hmm. okay? So anyway, uh, that was uh, the, the deal with the reserves, and uh, I joined in uh, 66, went to basic training myself in 67, and uh, in 68, I got promoted to staff sergeant, okay? And uh, that's uh, three strikes up and one, one down. So promotion was pretty fast in the reserves. But okay, the, but typically they, it was fast? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, it really was, probably more so than, than a regular Army unit. Hmm. But basically because we were training, mm -hmm. okay? And you had to have the, the rank to go along with the training. And... Uh, Sooner or later, in uh, 68 and 69, they asked me if I wanted to become a drill sergeant. And I said, wow. That's impressive. Yeah, I had the high respect for drill sergeants from basic training. I'll talk about that a little more in a few minutes. And uh, that's, the, uh, that's the drill sergeant hat, and that's the drill sergeant badge. And uh, we went to uh, two weeks one year and two weeks the following year during our annual uh, due to training but it was run by regular Army drill sergeants themselves. Okay. So uh, it was a really, really interesting school. So uh, I, uh, yeah, I got uh, my drill sergeant hat in uh, 69, and then in the summers of 70 and 71, when we went down, I actually took over as a drill sergeant with a basic training uh, company. And uh, I'll tell you a few of some of the things about that as we get going. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. Uh, 1971, I got offered to go to OCS, become an officer. And uh, they uh, saw some leadership capability in me, and uh, I had to go take uh, uh, some exams for it, conducted by the regular Army uh, uh, cadre, and then I went for eight weeks of training at Fort Benning, Georgia, and I got commissioned as a second lieutenant. So I am one of the rare ones, actually, who got to see the Army from both sides, as an enlisted man and as an officer. And uh, I've got to, uh, quite a bit to talk about that. And uh, it was really, really great. Matter of fact, they told me that as far as the Army Reserve goes, I was the first across the country to ever get a drill sergeant hat and get commissioned as an officer. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I thought that was a pretty, pretty neat thing, you know. It sure is. Although I made sure that I realized it didn't make me better than anybody else, but it <laughs> certainly made me a better soldier you know, to see it from both sides. And uh, in 73, I took the officer's advance course to get qualified from first lieutenant. And then in uh, 76, I left the service because of family reasons, so on and so forth. For a total of 10 years? Yeah, yeah, that's it in a nutshell. And uh, Wow, okay. So I would like to ask you about your earliest days in the service more in depth about basic training and things like that. Oh yeah, basic training. Yeah, that's that's always fun for anybody. It's a it's a can be a rude awakening. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, me in a photo during basic training, and uh, interesting way they took that picture. I'll tell you, you never know what they're gonna do. <laughs> I was in basic training. It was our second week. We had just got back from field maneuvers, and our boots were muddy, our pants were muddy, and everything. You know. And we get up there, we're starting to address, and the senior drill sergeant comes in and says, calls us to attention. And he says, says, take off your upper field jacket and your upper shirt and put on your Class A shirt, tie, and, and uh, uh, Class A hat. 
Get in formation. You got two minutes. What the heck? We've got these grubby boots on and everything, and now we're going to pants, and now we're going to put our clean Class A jacket on over. My God. So anyway, we do that, and they march us all down to this place, and they get us in line. They take our pictures. So that picture you're seeing of me. <laughs> you look clean. Nice, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure, if you could have seen the bottom half of me. Oh, my God. So... <laughs> Then when we got back, we had to pack those things up and send them off to the cleaners and everything. Oh my God, it was. But that's the kind of stuff you run in the basic training. You never know one minute to, to the next. Okay? Now, would you dare I, you say you were grumbling and saying, "What do you mean two minutes?" Do you say that out loud? Would oh, you be reprimanded if oh, no, 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 you were no. just quietly? No, 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 no. you don't back grumble. talk to the drill sergeant. No, I didn't think so. I was, <laughs> I was wondering about that. Okay. Yeah. We did a lot of grumbling among ourselves. You know, yes. But, okay. That's safe. And training was uh, intimidated, but it made me more responsible. And I gained a lot of respect for drill sergeants, and th that's where it began. For one of the big reasons I wanted to get my drill sergeant hat, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, my drill sergeant, his name was Sergeant uh, Truman, and he was a great role model. Made me understand that the harassment and the drill sergeants uh, harass you. And I had to learn how to do it later on myself, you know. And everybody always refers to that full movie, Full Metal Jacket, you know, with, where uh, he's, you know, if you've ever seen the movie, it's unbelievable the, the stuff that the Marine recruits go through. Well, a lot of that in the Army, too, you know. But they're only doing it to try to make you better people and to weed out the deadwood. They have to do that too. You have to be able to take instant orders, you know, when you're under fire and stuff and everything. Mm -hmm. And during basic training, that's why the, the intimidation and everything, uh, it, it isn't personal, you know, but a lot of the recruits took it that way. You know, mm -hmm. it took a while to get over it. Uh, Fort Dix was next to require McGuire Air Base. That's where I took my basic training. And uh, one interesting note, the end of the runway of McGuire Air Base was right next to Fort Dix. So once in a while, uh, on a weekend, they might give us a few hours off. Several of us would be down at the end of the runway, and they had these big F-4 Phantom jets. And they'd take off, and they'd go roaring, and, and right over our heads, you know, a couple of hundred feet. We'd have to, wow. you know, we'd have to go like this, and you'd see these shock diamonds, you know, it was just... What's that? Uh, it's, uh, well, shock diamonds are at the tail end of the exhaust. There's so much power, you actually see the air shape into, into like, di diamond shapes. That's really it's, neat. Yeah, it's just incredible to see, you know. How many people would you say didn't make it through basic training? Is there a percentage that... Mm, yeah, I, I had a lot of experience with that when I was a drill sergeant, too, yeah. About 85% uh, make, make it through. Make it through, you know, okay. The, the rest wash out, typically, mm. know, yeah, for, for different reasons. True. Know. And we stayed in World War II-type barracks. It's, it's different now. Uh, they have all the brick barracks and stuff and so forth, but... Uh, you know, we had single bunks and just a foot locker and a wall locker, and we had a communal latrine. It was very Spartan living, and uh, no civilian clothes at all, you know. Oh. You weren't allowed in basic training, no, just what the Army gave you. But we were too busy to notice. I mm -hmm. mean, it was just unbelievable the schedules they had that I had us on, you know. What you know, time did you get up? Lights out at 10 o'clock and up at 4 a.m., oh, you know, it was, it was that typical, is typical, you know. For eight weeks straight? Yeah. Any break, any... Time. Well, seventh and eighth week, you started to get weekend pass. Or, oh, know, good. Like that. They started to back off a bit. And then you could yeah. see the light at the end of oh, the tunnel. Oh, yeah. The light at the end of the tunnel. Sometimes it turned into the headlight of the oncoming train, too. But <laughs> <laughs> you never knew. Anyway, uh, midway through training, uh, about six weeks, my brother Dennis gave me a surprise. Now, he was in the Army Reserve, too. But anyway, uh, he called up and said, we're coming down to see you. And uh, I, I did have that weekend off. I think it was seventh week. Mm -hmm. And uh, he shows up with my girlfriend, Aww. Diane, the woman I married. And that was a surprise. He didn't even say she was coming, you know. Oh, so, uh, uh, I, you know. Were I you emotional? See, oh, God, I guess, you know. Uh, it was just great of my brother to do that, and his wife came too. In fact, that's a, that's a picture of us uh, standing together, the three of us, 
And if you remember from the family uh, photo when I was just a little youngster, how short I was compared to him, mm -hmm. well, Thanks, you Jim. took on my father's jeans, which was very short, and I took on my mother's jeans, and she was very tall for a woman. So you can see the difference in, in height there in the three of us. And that's his uh, wife to the right of me, Pauline, mm -hmm. who uh, just passed away about a month and a half ago, and my brother took that very hard. They were married 59 years. 59 years. But anyway, that was so great of them to take yes. a, a weekend off to drive, you know, down to Fort Dix, 300-some-odd miles, you know. <sighs> They spent the night with my wife to be, you mm -hmm. know, at a, at a motel, and they drove back the next day. So mm -hmm. I thought that was, you know, I've always uh, told him and her, his wife, I respect them so much for that. Yeah. And uh, the picture of the uh, statue to the right, that's me and my wife Diane on the left. Mm -hmm. That my uh, brother took. So that was taken during that visit that they made? Yeah, yeah. 1967. And I can't remember if you mentioned at the beginning, what is the age difference between your brother Dennis and Six years. He's six, six years. years older than I am. So I was 18, so they were 23 and 24 at the mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Wow. You'll never forget that. No. That helped you get through, yeah. I'm sure. So basic training was a lot of early rising uh, PT, which is physical training, you know, every day. Classroom stuff, hand-to-hand -hand combat, bivouac, camping out, you know. And, you know, Maine winters versus New Jersey, I was used to the cold and stuff. And the w one week we spent three days out in the field, they had it turned cold and wet and everything. And we had a lot of recruits from the big cities and stuff and everything. Oh, my God. Several of them got frostbite and stuff oh. and everything. And uh, I, I wound up helping several of them, you know. Uh, I had a spare pair of gloves, you know. And the theirs were all wet, so I lent them uh, to one guy, and, and you know, so uh, that was really tough on some of them. I can imagine. Yeah. Uh, I excelled at PT. I was in really good shape. I always had been when I was a kid, and especially the mile run. Uh, that's, that's me in the photo over there, the one that says mile run. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw the value in the drill sergeant's constant drills following orders, making up our bunks the exact army way, and all of this made me a much better man than I was before I joined the service. And Sergeant Truman also told us there's the right way, the wrong way, and the army way. <laughs> uh, during grenade throwing, and that's a picture of me there on my uh, knee with a grenade behind my uh, head, uh, it was the army way to have your arm out for grenade throwing, pointing at the thing you were going to th throw it at. And, uh, that's the typical of the Army way, the right way, the wrong way, you know. Mm -hmm. So that night, every night Sergeant Truman got together with us just before we hit the sack and uh, with the whole company and wanted us to, you know, we all went over the day's training, any questions we had and everything. He, he, was, he was great for that. So that day we were doing the grenade throwing. I said, look, I said, Drill Sergeant, this right way, wrong way, the Army way. I said, what the heck is this about, you know, you tell us to rock up and to throw the grenade, but you want us to point our friggin' arm at the target. What's the difference? What's the make? He says, well, I'm going to tell you. He says, there's a doggone good reason for that. He says, if you've ever thrown a baseball or pitched it or watched a, picture, a pitcher, they step back and they lean forward and they come down on their left arm and they throw with their body weight behind it. Mm -hmm. He said, you can't do that when you're kneeling down. He says... Uh, you're just going to throw from the shoulder. He says, so you can't get any momentum. So when you stick your arm out like that, he says, and then you throw it, you swing your arm down, your body goes forward, and now you're throwing from your upper chest and not just your arm. He says, so there's a reason for everything. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, so he, he was willing to do that to, to explain to us. You know, yeah, that sounds, you know. that's uh -huh. great that he was approachable. Um, were those live grenades? That, uh, yeah, that, pi that picture there, no, that wasn't, but we did mm -hmm. throw live. You did? Yes, we did. Yes, you yeah. had to. Yeah. Wow. So you put 10 years into the Army Reserves. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us some about that 10 years? Highlights? Yeah, yeah, I'll give it a shot. Well, after basic training, I went back to, you know, drilling, you know, the Monday nights and so on and so forth. And... Uh, 
68, I got promoted to staff, staff sergeant. And uh, reserve uh, training units at that time decided they needed drill sergeants in training units like ours. So uh, I volunteered. I'd like to be a drill sergeant, you know. So anyway, I attended uh, two two-week uh, summer camps instead of going with the unit and taking over a training unit. Uh, I went to two, uh, you know, sessions for uh, drill sergeant school, and it was conducted by regular army drill sergeants. And I'll tell you, a lot of that first week, the first summer, was like basic training all over again. You know, <laughs> it was, it was really something. But uh, they really got into the uh, drill and ceremonies, physical training, extensive uh, leadership training, a lot about the. Uh, uh, the uh, Uniform Code of Military Justice, you know, the uh, military law we had to deal with, and learning a lot of practical uh, leadership skills from regular Army uh, drill sergeants. Mm -hmm. So anyway, in 69, the second uh, uh, two-week session, I uh, graduated, put on the hat, and uh, I'll tell you, I was so proud to put that hat on. And that drill sergeant bed, you don't know. If you've never seen anybody strut while sitting down, that was me, <laughs> I'll tell you. Yeah. I don't know if I was more proud that day or the day I got my commission uh, a couple of years later. But anyway, so uh, following summer's uh, annual ACDUTA uh, training, you know, the two-week deal, we took over basic training. And it was hard to adjust from normal, you know, NCO duties to... Uh, being a drill sergeant, it really, really was. I mean, and the the biggest uh, advantage I had on that was going through basic training and remembered how the drill sergeants treated us, you mm -hmm. know, and so forth. And uh, so I used my basic training experiences to help understand what the trainees themselves were going through. And uh, the biggest problem I had was trying to keep a straight face when I was harassing the troops, you know. <laughs> tell them all these things, you know, that... Uh, you know, it was just crazy, you know, uh, uh, and... <laughs> Did you ever lose it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got into serious, well, kind of semi-serious trouble. I was, when we'd go down and take over as a drill sergeant, it, it was for two weeks. And for the first couple, three days, the regular Army drill sergeant would stick around just to make sure you were going to handle the base training company okay. And usually after two or three days, they'd kind of disappear, maybe come back two or three days later just to check on you and everything. But they'd make kind of a, you know, home vacation out uh -huh. of it themselves. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I think the second or third day, this uh, the first year I did this, he, he, he was, uh, you know, making some comment to the, to the company that uh, oh, I just found hilarious and I couldn't keep a straight face. <laughs> in front of all these troops, and he's dressing them down, you know. And, and I just started chuckling a little bit. And of course, several of the basic training guys picked up on that. And, <laughs> you know, they started chuckling too, and he turned around and looked at me with daggers in his eyes. He, you just don't chuckle as a, as a drill sergeant, you know, mm -hmm. in front of the troops, you know. So anyway, he let it go. But what I didn't realize, my senior drill sergeant, uh, Sergeant Watson, reservist, saw me. And he says, uh, come to me afterwards, and he says, okay. And he says, I saw that. You know you don't laugh in front of these guys. He says, you think they're your, your buddies, don't you? You want to be buddies with them, don't you? I'll tell you what, he says, Drill Sergeant Moore, I'll tell you what. Tomorrow morning, 0500, you report to the mess hall, and I don't want you to have your hat on or your badge, just regular fatigues, and you're going to perform KP duty with these guys, and I understand they're going to be cleaning out the uh, grease pits. He says, so let's see how much buddies you want to be with them now. <laughs> he says, you be there, 0500 tomorrow morning. And he walked away. Oh, my God, what do I do now? <laughs> he, well, he came back later then. I said, did you learn your lesson? I says, yes, drill sergeant, senior drill, I did. He says, well, forget the KP thing. So I learned my lesson <laughs> there. Don't ever laugh in front of the troops. Oh, my God. So, but uh, anyway... Uh, later in 71, uh, I was offered uh, to go to OCS, uh, Officer Candidate School. And uh, with the Vietnam winding down, a lot of people were getting out, so the Army Reserve needed more officers. So uh, anyway, I took, took the exams, you know. Unfortunately, I'd never been to college, and basically you, you need, you're supposed to be a college graduate to be an officer, you know. But they mm -hmm. waived that requirement because they needed the officers so bad. Interesting. But I had to go to Manchester. Division headquarters and take this battery of tests and 
I did great on it. You know, it was mostly leadership stuff, not not academics anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, so anyway, as uh, OCS was 12 weeks, okay, again, it was reservist, but it was conducted by reg regular army. And uh, we received all kinds of practical training in leadership, tactics, uh, all kinds of uh, weapons, fired just about every weapon the army had, you know, Browning 50 calibers, 155 howards. So we got to f fire all that to uh, just to demonstrate it to us in case we had to take over a rifle company or a howitzer company. You never know where you're going to get assigned to, you know. Mm -hmm. We got to drive tanks, armored personnel carriers, but not to get qualified, just for f familiarity, you know. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of uh, leadership and uh, tactics and, and so on and so forth because once you got your commission as a second lieutenant, you were expected to take over a platoon-sized, uh, you know, unit, which is typically... Uh, 35 to 50 guys you mm -hmm. know, for a rifle platoon or a mechanized platoon, uh, so on and so forth, okay? So anyway, I got my uh, commission, and that was a very, very proud day. And uh, while I was gone, my wife, I, we had two young kids, you know, four or five years old, and she, I was so, you know, proud that she said, go, you get a chance to go and get this, you know, and... Uh, she was uh, working full time, taking care yeah. of needed repairs around the house. That's her. That, that, that's her on the ladder there. Uh, while I was gone, I couldn't have done it without her support. You know, so I graduated as a second lieutenant, and I was really, really proud on that day. Uh, and uh, I got two diplomas: one for the training school. So, uh, the president of the United States says, "Congratulations! Now you're an officer and a gentleman." You know, so, <laughs> wow. and uh, I've got another picture here of uh, my family welcoming me home after 12 long weeks and mm -hmm. gone, you know, so, you know. In 1973, I went back to Fort Benning for uh, advanced officer course training to qualify for first lieutenant, okay. Uh, this time I took my wife and children with me, and uh, amazingly, we met a woman and her husband from Oklahoma uh, we lived at a place called Camellia Apartments, and we still see them. In fact, we're going back to Oklahoma again, again this year, next month. Oh, to that's see them. wonderful. So it's been a continued friend, friendship. And it uh, goes to show you people you meet in a train in uh, service can sometimes uh, have a lasting relationships, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, this course, uh, the advanced course, unlike uh, the officer basic course, qualify you for second lieutenant and qualifies you up to first lieutenant. And uh, there was less emphasis on the hands-on training, the learning the vehicles and learning uh, uh, the, the weapons and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. It was more developing leadership skills, okay, such as uh, uh, tact and things like that, and a lot more classroom training. Fort Benning it was a big base, and it had a wonderful training facility called uh, Infantry Hall. And uh, this training went beyond any training I attended as an enlisted man. And that we're being trained to command an entire company now of uh, 40 to 60 soldiers of uh, men, you know, instead of a platoon. You know. mm -hmm. And much of this training served me well in life and later on when I got out of the service. We were, for example, we were taught the importance of using tact dealing with people intact uh, is best described as the ability to tell someone to go to hell and make them enjoy the trip you know <laughs> it's <laughs> 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 and the way this training was conducted was simple would be on a large classroom okay and separate tables of four to five of us sat in small group and situations would be presented to us such as what would be the best way to counsel a soldier seeking advice about a personal problem okay and we would discuss it and decide if it was better to tell the soldier to man up, okay, <laughs> and solve your own problems, you know, or take the time to advise a soldier on what he could, you know, do to help or, or somewhere in between, mm -hmm. you know. So we learned a lot in those roundtable discussions about different ways to solve these different wow. problems. And we were also taught the five basic styles of leadership, and uh, one being total authoritarian, my way or the highway. Mm -hmm. And progressing down through five, and the uh, bottom uh, fifth of your leadership is no leadership at all. 
you let all your NCOs and everybody make all your decisions, you sit back and drink a beer or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, you know, the, the middle of the road is, is the best, mm -hmm. you know, combination of proper tact and leadership and authoritarianism. You gotta know when to, you know, do, do it, each one of them, you know. Mm -hmm. One example I remember very well, we were shown this film. Now this was, uh, what was it, 71? Yeah. They still showed black and white films. I mean, they, nobody had VCRs yet or anything. They showed these black and white 16 millimeter films on, on, on screen. So they had a mortar crew and they were firing a mortar. A mortar is a tube launched, you know, rocket type okay. thing. And uh, they had a misfire. Now when you have a misfire, the, uh, one of the crew members has to disconnect the rocket from its base plate, uh, the, the tube, lean it over so somebody can catch the rocket as it's coming out with their fingers, and, but you can't hit the fuse, you know? Okay. So they had to go through that procedure, and just as they're going through it, the thing blows up in their hands. Three of them get killed. So now the film cut to the next day, okay? And they're all there again except for three new replacements. And, of course, they have another misfire. And the uh, officer, the uh, lieutenant, uh, tells them, go through the misfire procedure. And they turn around and look at him and start yelling, screw you, sir. We know what happened yesterday. There's no way we're going to do that today. And uh, so now, what's he do? And he turns, he turns, you know, uh, the screen, he turns to look at us and says, what would you do, lieutenant? You know, so now we're in this five round table discussion, the five man groups, and boy, we we come up with all kinds of different ideas mm -hmm. for that one. But that's what the training was like, and how you apply tact to it, how you, mm -hmm. you know, do all of these things. It was one of the greatest training I ever met, I ever had in my life, and it served me so well in later life in dealing I with bet. people. It mm -hmm. really, really did. Personally and in oh yeah, in, work, in all, work. all my walks of life, yeah. you know, you know, jobs and everything. So uh, yeah, that, that was great. And uh, we had uh, Ranger Week where uh, we uh, spent a week with the Rangers and they were, they were nutcases. They, they used to compete with us to see who'd go without sleep the longest. You know, it was uh, catch a rattlesnake and cook it and stuff like that. Oh my God, it was mm. something else. So anyway, and, uh, so that was uh, qualified me for first lieutenant, and uh, I got promoted to first lieutenant, and I got made executive officer of our reserve company back in Rochester. You know. mm -hmm. And uh, in 1975, I went to the uh, maneuver captain's course, phase one, which would qualify me for captain and then to have my own company. You know. Mm -hmm. And I went with my brother to that one. He had already been to see phase one was... Uh, one summer in phase two was in the following summer. He'd already been to phase one, and he was going to take phase two. So we both went down together in uh, 71. And uh, wow, that's, that's really a picture neat. of us together. And uh, you can see, again, how much shorter he is than I, than I am, you know. And uh, this course concentrated on both leadership and advance uh, tactics uh, up at the company level. Now, company level, you're in charge of... Uh, anywhere from 50 to 250 men, you know, so wow. a lot more uh, uh, leadership and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how you feel that you and the others that you were in the armed forces with were best supported by the military in terms of equipment and communication and all of the other things that might be involved. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you, I, you know, my experience is based on, you know, 54 years ago, and today's technology is, is just incredible. But I'll, I'll tell you basically what a lot of things the technology uh, has done. Mm -hmm. uh, this knife, for example, was given to me by my stepfather. Uh, as I said before, my real father died when I was 10, and then three years later my mother remarried, and uh, his name was uh, Bill Maloney. And he was a really, really interesting guy. I could talk about him all day. <laughs> but anyway, he was in the Army in the 1930s, and it was between wars, you know. And uh, he was a Jeep driver. But he uh, gave me this knife, and uh, although uh, it, it looks like a lot of bayon a lot like a bayonet, it, it, it isn't, okay. But uh, the one thing I want to talk about, back in those days, they had very little made out of plastic. I mean, look at this sheath, you know, mm -hmm. it's leather, 
And then it's a, a, uh, a, a canvas, and uh, they had this belt, you know. Mm -hmm. And although this looks like plastic, it isn't. No, it Okay? It, that is actually metal. Yeah. You know, but it's just uh, cut, cut so that you can grip it easy. Mm -hmm. But feel the weight of that. Yeah. You know? Imagine going into battle just carrying that right. and a whole bunch All of right. other stuff, too. Mm -hmm. Everything is so lightweight now. You know, the, the armed <clears throat> soldier, the armed forces soldier today going into battle is more lethal than at any time in history. The amount of firepower. Mm -hmm. Give me a rifle company of today and put them up against the, the entire <laughs> people that fought the Confederate Civil War. And it would only take one company of men to win that war, wow. you know, with the firepower they have. Yeah. Never mind the helicopters and True. gunships and everything else, you know. Yeah. Wow. Impressive and interesting. Yeah. So when it came time for you to leave the armed forces, mm. how yeah. did you feel? How did you make that decision? Mm. How did you feel? What was it like? Well, you know, that was interesting because uh, after I made first lieutenant, I got transferred from Rochester to, to Saco. And we had a uh, Army Reserve unit, you know, up there. Still part of the same division, 76th Division. But uh, the thing it was longer to travel. Mm -hmm. And my kids at home, the family, and both of us working and everything, it just got to be too much for me. So uh, in 76, I resigned my commission. And mm -hmm. uh, that gave me my 10 years, you know, in the service. And uh, I missed and still remember the people. We had a reunion back about five or six years ago, and it was great to see a lot of these Oh, that's people. really nice. Yeah, it was nice. That must have been difficult. Yeah. But you made the right decision, I'm sure you feel. Mm -hmm. And thinking about your experience and thinking about the things you just said about how things have changed, um, would you encourage people to join the armed forces now? Would you? Yes, I, I would, you know, with some reservations for the most part. But, yeah, definitely. Uh, Joining the armed forces, as long as you join for the right reasons, I, I think is is great. You know, mm -hmm. practically every generation, you know, has has fought a war of one kind or another, and wars are fought for all kinds of reasons, whether it be ideology or religions, or for the most part, wanting resources that other countries don't have. You know, for one reason or another, the world is rarely at peace, totally at peace with every nation, you know, at peace with another. There's always something going on. But the biggest thing is, when you join the armed forces, you're joining for the honor, duty, you know, country, but really to defend our way of life. That's what it's, 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 it's all about. There's so many... Uh, wars that we've had to defend ourselves because other countries want to change our way of life one way or another. You know, they want what we've got or, you know, can you imagine like World War II, you know, we were fighting the Germans, the, the Japanese, you know, and uh, I can't imagine we ever lost one of them wars and speaking Japanese today and having a Japanese democracy, our way of life would be much different. <laughs> We wouldn't have the cell phones, the convenience stores, and all kinds of things we have today, you know. Mm -hmm. Our way of life is certainly an easy one in comparison to many, many countries, and that's why, True. you know, a lot of it is, uh, that's why a lot of wars are fought, really. Think about what the pioneers and the settlers went through. You think about that. Okay, here they were, 16, 1700s, living in log cabins. Mm -hmm. You know, long winter nights, what did they do? They only had candles and stuff and everything. It was a very Spartan life. Mm -hmm. No doctors, no convenience stores. You had to grow all your own food and process True. it and everything. But yet, they still were willing to fight for that way of life mm -hmm. against the British because of taxation without representation. So every generation we've had has that had to at least consider fighting for our way of life. And that's what you have to consider if you're going to become a soldier. Mm -hmm. so that's very well what may, may, may be happen. We lost thousands and thousands of World War II. We lost thousands of Vietnam, World War I, you name it. Mm -hmm. And they were all fighting for our way of life so we could have the way of life we have today.
Mm -hmm. You know, I think too many people take the lifestyle we enjoy for granted and never think about those servicemen and women who fought and died over the years in battles and endured incredible hardships so we could be free from dictatorships and continue to improve our way of life. Mm -hmm. Other good reasons to join the service is that you learn discipline, teamwork, and you gain a lot of self-confidence in yourself. I'll tell you, that really was something I noticed over the years, you know, having served both as an enlisted man and an officer, the incredible confidence you gain mm -hmm. in, in, in that. Uh, you can also learn some good skills in the military that will help you get a good job and get out of the service, okay? Uh, machine repair, computer, communications technology, I mean, the sky's the limit, you know? And uh, the pay is pretty good by today's standards, too, okay? If you take a look at a pay chart in year one, okay, uh, just for being uh, in the service in one year, you can earn $32,000 a year. That's pretty good money by today's standards, plus there's other benefits like housing allowance and so forth, okay? At the end of four years in the service, you know, depending on what rank you, you make, but it pretty much goes by time spent, okay? You can earn up to, uh, you can earn as high as $56,000 a year for being four years in the service. And uh, on the low side of that, it'd be at least 35000 if you don't, you know, you're not married, you don't have any housing allowance and so forth. Mm -hmm. And spend 10 years in the service, and you can be making a base pay of $76,000 a year, okay? That's a pretty good reason in itself to join the service. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I can't imagine you working at McDonald's for 10 years and then paying you $76,000 a year. <laughs> it ain't gonna happen. Right, you know? I mean, it, you uh, learn skills at McDonald's, but this, yeah. the things you've mentioned today. And, and like I said, if you learn a skill that is valuable on, on the outside, you know. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. it transfers. And then also uh, nowadays, uh, depending on your military occupational especially what we call MOS, you can get a hefty re-enlistment bonus. They pay some hefty re-enlistment bonuses if you to re-enlist because they need you in that particular wow. field, okay? Interesting. Just be careful, though, about hearing something like this and running out and joining the service just because you want to make some money, okay? <laughs> that makes you a mercenary, okay? And there's nothing wrong with that if you're fighting for a foreign country. Okay, there's a lot of mercenaries out there. There's even a magazine, uh, uh, what's that called? Uh, I can't think of the name of it. Uh, Soldier of Fortune, where they, you know, feature mercenaries. And, but the thing with a mercenary, you're just there for the money. You don't care about the cause mm -hmm. or anything else. And you can't do that in, in today's armed forces, whether it's the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, you name it. You've mm. got to care about defending your country and why and the lifestyle and everything I've talked about. Mm. You've got to be part of a team. I believe and that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so if you're just in it for the money, think of some other job, I, I think, anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's not for everybody, the service. If you have any severe mental issues about uh, not getting along, constant fighting with others, uh, not willing to be a team member, and not caring about duty, honor, and country, and not being able to take orders, <laughs> uh, then stay away from the service, <clears throat> okay? Uh, for example, when I was in basic training, I remember well we had a recruit who got in an argument. He liked to argue with everybody. He got in an argument with a drill sergeant and hit him, mm -hmm. okay? The next day, we saw him being escorted into the chow hall in handcuffs. Oh. And he was on his way to uh, prison until he could be court-martialed. And one of the worst things that can happen this is the worst. If you get court martial in the service or do anything to receive a dishonorable discharge, nobody wants a dishonorable discharge because you can never expect to get a job in government uh, service, uh, or local police, or fire departments. And many, many people who interview potential employees in any job will ask about military service, and it's perfectly legal. Mm -hmm. And if you have to explain a dishonorable discharge, you'll probably get the don't call us, we'll call you routine. <laughs> So that's why I would both encourage people to join the service, and maybe some people, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been wonderful. I've learned a lot. I'm wondering, before we close, is there anything else you'd like to add or mention? Uh, nope. I just want to mention I really appreciate the opportunity of doing this, and... Uh, 
I hope that people not only learned uh, a lot about, you know, my service, but in some of the opportunities of the service in general. I think that's for sure. I learned uh, interviewing you, and I, I'm sure the audience will learn quite a bit, too, after watching your interview. So thank you very much for being here with us today and for your presentation, the third installment of Project Remembrance. Um, we've been interviewing Dick Moore, United States Army Reserve, 10-year veteran, and we will be doing more interviews like this as time goes on. I'm your host for today, Maureen Nikitas with Berwick Community Television, and thank you very much. Have a great day.